Did you know game development is hard? Especially if, like me, you have a soft brain. I mean, everybody's brain is soft, but mine's like a souffle collapsing under its own weight in anything but perfect conditions. And the oven I'm exposing my delicate soft brain to is known as the Unity Game Engine. Actually, in this analogy, the souffle could represent the simple thing I'm trying to do at any given time. Have you ever tried to cook a souffle in an oven that turns off periodically and explodes at random intervals and also explodes at regular intervals and sometimes disappears completely and all the buttons and dials are hidden and the instruction manual is for an oven that came out five years ago and you only understand every other word and the manufacturers, instead of fixing the oven's tendency to turn off and explode and cause electrical fires, decide to add a new extension to the oven that makes smoothies but only sometimes makes smoothies and mostly this new feature just turns off and disappears and explodes and causes electrical fires and all the while you keep remixing the ingredients for the souffle just hoping to hope that this time the oven won't turn off or catch fire or disappear or get trapped in a bubble of space-time where a souffle takes an infinite amount of time to cook. And each time you fail to make the souffle, your souffle-like brain collapses a bit more. And you're getting more and more impatient and rushing the preparation of the ingredients and forgetting steps. And you forget where the souffle dish is so you decide to cook it in your shoe. Because that'll do. And once it's out, no one will know that you used a shoe. And there's 45,000 people in the next room waiting for the souffle and they're getting a bit impatient. And you brought out some snacks about three months ago, but for some reason some of them are still a bit restless. And the rest of them have just sort of forgotten why they're there. And that's game development. Well, that's my experience of it anyway, recently. And just to note, I'm not ragging on Unity. It's a magical piece of software made by an amazing team of innovators who are much smarter than I am. And my life wouldn't be the same without it. I do not envy the task that they have trying to keep up with their competitors by adding features and things. But the reality is that there are sometimes issues with the software that are hard to find your way around unless you have some sort of deep understanding of why things might go wrong without just relying on finding a post where somebody had the exact same problem and knew how to fix it. As some of you know, I've been working on a 3D platformer called ZeroTag, and I've been very regular and consistent in my uploads, with only gaps of uh, three to six months in between videos. And if we extrapolate, right now I'm on track to get it done by, well, never. But Perversely, I've been working super hard recently with the goal of seriously making something of this channel and absolutely nothing has gone my way. And here we are again, months since the last video, and I've got very little to show. <laughs> but I'm going to show you everything that went wrong because I thought that might be interesting instead. But before that, I'd like to tell you a short story. My father once said to me, Shun, you're a failure. You've always been a failure, and you'll always be a failure. And I said, No, father, I'm not going to be a failure anymore. I'm going to be a sellout. Introducing Core. No, son, don't you see? Core is a quality product, relevant to your YouTube channel and useful to your audience. So you failed to even sell out, you freaking idiot. <laughs> I'm going to drive off now, orphaning you and such. Core is a new PC gaming platform, and I'm honestly really happy to plug this thing. Apart from the fact that it just looks great out of the box, I would have loved to have had access to this kind of thing when I was in the early days of learning video game development. The idea that you can now just whip together a really good looking online multiplayer game, no coding required, is just amazing. There's a 50% revenue share with creators through the Core Perks program. They have thousands of free assets, and as a certified lazy person, that sounds good to me. Also, they've just got lots of really cool tools like voxel terrain and textures that blend seamlessly between objects, and online networking. I feel like that's worth mentioning twice because it's a hard thing to do, and it's all just taken care of for you. And even though you don't have to know how to code to use Core, you can extend your gameplay using Lua scripting. And best of all, it's completely free. Sounds pretty good, right? So download Core now using the link in the description. For the new DevDog, the plan was to start building the gigantic city slash hub world mentioned in episode two. I thought I'd start by making one building just to get a sense of the visual, visual language. Visual language. I don't like the way the door is visible beyond the bounds of the wall, so I'd really like to just hide that part so I don't have to be super accurate with the modeling of all the buildings. I just made a simple shader where if the door goes outside of an invisible box, it doesn't appear. And that only took about an hour altogether. 
I'm thinking as part of the design philosophy we'll just keep everything super simple so that it doesn't break when you scale it. Things with detail tend to look obviously scaled up or down but if you keep the design of things super simple then hopefully you can reuse stuff and scale it up and down and nobody will be able to tell the difference. Okay, slight problem, the door, even though it doesn't look like it's there, it's still casting shadows, which can be easily solved by stopping the door from casting a shadow at all, which is fine, it's not realistic, but I'm stupid, so that's the best I can come up with. Moving on. And now we upgrade the door to a high-tech portaloo. Nice. I decided it'd be really useful to use the shade of the windows too, so I can just move them around and cut a pretend hole in the wall and not have to model each individual window, which was pretty simple to achieve. Wait, no, the outside works, but the inside doesn't. Okay, that's fixed. What, wait, no, there's some weirdness happening there now. So spend a whole day figuring out what's causing it, and another fixing it, and it's fixed. Oh, wait, where'd the door go? Oh, it only appears inside the window now. Okay, weird. Okay, fixed. Wait, no. The shader also stops the inside of the room from rendering? And the inner window is visible from the outside. Okay, add another pass, add another shader, separate the inner and outer walls, make sure the order of the passes is correct, and... Okay, it works. Ah, no. Windows break when they're viewed through other windows now. Um, spend the next few days researching shaders and basically come to the conclusion that I'm doing everything correctly, essentially. Then spend another few days just randomly clicking about and, and try and just happen on the solution. When that doesn't work, sell my soul to the devil and... Wow, yeah, okay, finally it works. I'm not feeling so productive anymore. That took two weeks just to make a window, but hey, at least it works now. It was worth it. That is until I realized that as soon as you put one building next to another, the whole effect breaks. It's unusable. That's two weeks wasted. The same amount of time it took me to make two games in my previous video. Okay, shake it off. That wasn't Unity's fault. That was my own fault for making things hard for myself. I could have just modeled the windows all along, but I chose to spend two weeks doing that. So lesson learned, let's move on. There was an issue where, whereas in tight spaces, the camera was way too claustrophobic. So I came up with a solution where on entering a room, the camera's field of view changes to give it a more blown out perspective. Perfect, okay, this game design thing isn't so hard after all. And luckily the long history of camera issues I struggled with for so long is still over thanks to Cinemachine. Wait, it's broken. So basically I want to be able to hide behind a wall and appear as a silhouette without the camera jumping forwards, uh, but I want it to stay there when it does jump forwards, and instead the camera is getting pushed backwards through thin walls. Those of you who've followed the devlogs know that I've been struggling with camera issues for a long time, so this is kind of disheartening, and after extensive googling I've found no one else with this problem, and I've made forum posts and bug requests and nothing's really come of it. Okay, so let's not get disheartened. It appears Cinemachine is just lacking a feature. So let's figure it out somehow. I just need to see if the camera is being repositioned by a blocking collider and then tell it not to consider transparent walls until it's returned to its default distance. Luckily, there's a method I can use to check collisions called displaced, which doesn't work. Yeah, it just always returns false no matter what the collisions are actually doing. And again, nobody on the internet seems to have had this problem. So let's keep figuring it out. Okay, make it so that if the camera is close enough to the player, the game assumes that the camera is being blocked and then ignores transparent walls. Okay, that works. Apart from when it doesn't and just pops through certain walls. And the conditions for this happening seem to be completely random. Whatever, my blood pressure is rising, so let's move on. So back in this little house and transparent walls are just no longer working. Just a reminder, it should be doing this and it's actually just snapping to the player no matter what. I ran every sort of check imaginable to diagnose the problem. It appears I'm doing everything perfectly. Hold on, if I move the house slightly to the left it works again for some reason. That doesn't make any sense. If I duplicate the house and put the duplicate in the original position, that now works, but the house that was working a second ago isn't. Well, that makes even less sense. Uh, why would something stop working based on the existence of an entirely unrelated object? Okay, keep the working original house in that position and delete the duplicate. 
and it doesn't work anymore. This is like measuring a person's weight, but as soon as another person enters the room, the first person's weight doubles. It makes no sense. Maybe I should be googling quantum theory. After a lot of googling and not really knowing what to search for, I finally stumbled across a forum thread where somebody is theorizing about the accuracy of the Cinemachine Collider on complex meshes. It turns out that if a mesh is sufficiently complex, Cinemachine collisions just straight up break entirely. And this is apparently sufficiently complex because it's concave. The thing is, collisions will continue to work mostly, just not for transparent walls. It's a pretty specific problem, so most people won't have encountered it, but I'm still surprised more people haven't run into it. The only solution I can think of at the moment for this is to not use mesh colliders at all and just literally construct every bit of the collider out of primitive shapes. I'm not going to separately remodel an entire city out of primitives just so the this like one camera effect will work. The real answer is that it should just work in the first place and I'm going to have to wait for Unity to fix the problem. For now, let's focus on creating the city and just forget the camera issues. So ProBuilder is a polygon modeling tool inside of Unity itself. I've heard great things, so I decided I wanted to use ProBuilder to make everything in my project. So I start building and pretty much immediately I discover that there's no feature to delete vertices. You know, I'm just saying, if I was to create a polygon modeling tool, my list of features to add would look something like 1. Ability to add vertices. 2. Ability to remove vertices. And then literally everything else. I continued pushing on with ProBuilder, but as the mesh got more and more complex, and I say complex, but the poly count isn't high, Unity starts to chug longer and longer every time I make a change until I'm waiting half an hour every time I hit undo. This time I did manage to find some people online with the same issue, and it turns out this is a known issue to do with prefabbed ProBuilder meshes. It's supposedly fixed in the latest version, but what can I tell you, I have the latest version and it's not fixed. So I go in search of a third-party polygon modeler and I find a solution. Uh, it's a tool that looks really amazing and it has a bunch of crazy advanced features. Stuff that I wish Blender and similar programs had, like really innovative stuff. So I buy it and fall in love and gush to the development team on Discord until I discover that if there's more than one material on your mesh, all but one will be removed every time you make a change. Selecting faces just often doesn't work and you have to zoom in really close to select them. Transformations are often just forgotten when you hit play in the editor. A lot of the time edges just can't be deleted and that includes selecting the whole object and deleting it, like the edges will just remain. Materials on certain faces will just break when viewed from certain angles. The bridge tool just misses out faces and inverts the normals in a weird way. The loop cut tool and other tools just break the mesh. And apparently anything over a certain size just is a no-no. So I can't make a city with this tool. Moving on. So I decide, hey, contrary to what I said earlier, I don't actually need the base of the city to be a prefab, so I can just use ProBuilder for that. But because of the lack of features in ProBuilder, it's going to take a lifetime to model everything in Unity. So I decide I need some tools and techniques for quickly prototyping a city, something I can use as a base to just flesh out the city and then heavily edit. There are a lot of very basic Unity asset store assets, but they all create very uniform grids, very square. And that's probably the limit of what I'd be able to create in a tool myself. So I want something that's a bit more advanced that creates more organic, messy kind of patterns. So I have a vision for this city, which I decided to name Monolith due to the appearance of the battle tower in the center. I wanted this city to be like a corrugated iron ski slope where you use these sort of inverse zip lines to zoom up to the top and then roll back down to the bottom across these metal rooftops, using them as ramps and zooming down these streets and alleys and winding paths. The main inspiration I have for the look of the city is a town in Chile called Valparaiso where the buildings are all made of corrugated iron and painted amazing colours. It's known as the world capital of street art, which is embraced and part of the town's identity. Nothing is regular, it's all wonky and mad, and it all meshes together so well. So in Monolith, this sector of the city is considered the low-class area, and residents in the other sectors all dump their scrap and broken citizens over the wall into this sector. Then the residents use the scrap to like expand the city and make new buildings, with the city stacking higher and higher and getting more chaotic. So yeah, it's a big task and I'm basically going to need to find tools in order to help me achieve this a ridiculous goal. 
After much unsuccessful searching for a solution, I remembered a game I had seen called Townscaper. It's an ASMR type game where the only objective is to create these procedural cities by clicking around and the structures you can achieve are ridiculously appealing. So I thought if only there was a way to use this as a level editor for the base of my city and then heavily edit it for my needs. And then I discovered, my God, the developers made it so that you can export models out of the game. Thank you, Polygonal Jesus. Finally, something's going my way. And it gets even better than that. The exported model has all the different details separated into different layers, so I can easily get rid of any excess and strip it down to get like a really nice base for my city. So after playing around and getting some really nice looking structures, which still took many days to do, clicking around in Townscaper and exporting stuff, I decided to try and add some color. I had this idea that there would be no textures in the game at all. Everything would just be faces and materials. If I could achieve this and make it look good, it would speed up development a ton. So I decided to color the buildings as best I could by just assigning materials to the faces. I liked the results, but it was disappointingly time consuming still due to the fact that selecting faces is really slow in Pro Builder. So I looked to Blender for a solution. All I need to do is randomly assign colors to faces so half the work would be done already and then I could just clean up the bits I didn't like. And I found a plugin in Blender that lets me do exactly that. And I also discovered the decimate modifier which simplifies the mesh in a really nice way. So I get these unevenly sized panels which really sell the wonky metal shack city vibe that I'm going for I think. So I try this method with some other buildings and stick it back in the editor, uh, touching up the colour and shaping a few of the bits, and it's actually looking pretty promising for a first pass. It's just a little flat and noisy, I think. A big part of the problem, I think, is just that the lighting sucks. So let's experiment a bit with global illumination or bounce lighting, which is basically just a fancy word for realistic lighting where light bounces off of walls and they reflect their color onto other surfaces and it bounces around and creates dark areas in the corners where light bounces around less. And yeah, I think that's looking a lot better. You definitely get a sense of depth and scale with better lighting. Before this point, I'd thought quite a lot about the layout of the city based on the story that I have in mind. For example, this elevated bit is part of the city that's owned by essentially the prison guards of the city, or rather they're the security bots that were once used to protect the humans that used to inhabit the city from outside threats. Their function became unclear to them when the humans died out, and they now, in error, roam the tops of the walls stopping inhabitants from leaving the city rather than entering because according to their programming anything that has to pass over a wall must be dangerous. Of course many robots functions involve leaving the city and we see evidence of some trying to do so. This is a train that crashed through the wall in an escape attempt by some robots in the past and part of the story would be discovering that you can travel through this to get outside. This part of the city is a giant plate constructed over another part of the city. The construction robots were forced to make more structures as the population grew, but they weren't programmed with any guides on how to do that, which forced them to develop something like ingenuity. They're not very good at solving problems yet and therefore the plate is very unstable, requiring almost constant maintenance. These tunnels under the city contain the forges, factories and assembly lines that are responsible for all the construction in the sector. And up top, of course, is the entrance to the battle tower, with the market selling products to no one, as there are no humans anymore. The more you buy from them, the more they start to misunderstand that you might be a human, gaining you respect and opening doors within the city. And there's a bunch of other things I've thought up, but let's get back on track. So I go crazy with the modeling and sticking little chunks of city together to make this city. It's still very slow work just creating this base, but at least I can actually see myself finishing it, eventually. So at some point I decide to test the lighting on the new buildings I've built. So in order to use global illumination, I just need to select all the meshes and set them to static and... So, making Pro Builder meshes static makes them explode. This is once again a problem that I can't find any information about online. Apparently as a developer I'm at the bleeding edge of finding game destroying problems in Unity. I can get around this problem by 
unprobuilderizing the mesh each time I bake the lighting, but unprobuilderizing also triangulates the mesh, which makes it incredibly messy to work with, and there's no option to stop it from doing this. Also, when I undo after having removed ProBuilder from a model, it now loads for 45 seconds, just from now on. Whenever I undo anything, from now on, it loads for 45 seconds. Nevertheless, I worked like this for about a week, dreading making any kind of small mistake, but I made some progress with some pretty nice lighting until suddenly global illumination just began to buffer infinitely. I changed none of the settings, it just suddenly, for seemingly no reason, doesn't work at all. Once again, no one online seems to have had this problem, so there's no way for me to figure out how to solve it. I even reverted back to an old version of the project where it was working and it's still broken. I even reinstalled the same version of Unity and other versions and it's still broken. I even reinstalled and updated my graphic drivers several times. No luck. Then I discovered that my character controller is not working in this scene. Rolling is way too tight and none of the code that makes you maintain your top speeds when rolling seems to be working. In the scene I pulled it from it works perfectly, but with the exact same prefab in any other scene the rolling is now broken. I spent two weeks trying to diagnose this problem, but there are no errors. The two characters are identical in every way, the, they're the same prefab, as is the setup of the different levels as far as I can tell, apart from the fact that they're just different scenes. Oh, and my controller does this if I open Steam. To be clear, I'm not pressing any buttons here. This also happens if I plug in another controller, or if my controller becomes unplugged for even a moment, or if it's dormant for too long. To find out what conditions I needed to have a working controller took well over a week of experimentation. You can see from this diagnosis tool on the right, I'm not making any of these inputs. This is 100% Unity breaking. And the only way to fix this bug, once it started happening, I discovered, is to restart my computer, tell it to forget my controller, reconnect my controller, and pray that it doesn't happen again. Oh, and even better, once you actually build the project, it breaks even more. As in, the gamepad that was at least doing something, even if it was just random inputs, in-game just doesn't do anything. This is actually a known bug that I traced back to 2019. This here isn't the bug report page, but it's a similar one with similar comments below, where the devs have said the problem's been solved, and all the comments below say, no, it hasn't. Like, the update did nothing. And I'm using the same gamepad code that I used in Platwormer, which does work in build, so it... Again, it's just like a project corruption or something, I don't know. Then my project started taking ages to load whenever I tried to do anything. Run the scene, wait two minutes. Stop running the scene, wait two minutes. Undo, wait two minutes. Save the scene, wait two minutes. You would not believe how much time this quickly amounts to. And because the problem is just that everything is taking ages to compile, I don't see any way to debug it. There are no errors. Uh, everything's just normal from the software's perspective. I've looked at the profiler and it all looks normal. For all I know, the loading box is just failing to disappear and it's actually not doing anything. And here's some footage of me just jumping around because frankly I'm tired of capturing footage of errors. And you better believe there are more errors. My entire project just started crashing. It had been crashing already occasionally, but now it was doing it like every 15 minutes. And once again, I was unable to diagnose the problem. And OmniSharp in VS Code, which tells me errors in the code, now just stops working at the drop of a hat. So I was constantly having to reinstall it. And, and recently the method I used to fix this that I'd been using all along just stopped working. So no more error messages or debugging at all, I guess. Are you tired of listening to all these problems yet? Imagine spending all your time trying to fix them and moving on only to encounter more problems, or maybe not even fixing the current problems before you encounter more problems. I was honestly trying so hard to get new videos out and start to release videos regularly, but after two months I've pretty much got nothing to show. So now I'm having to reconsider everything. The thought of the massive amount of work it would take to get this game done with everything working perfectly is already kind of daunting, let alone with all these problems. And getting one video out every three months is not good enough when I'm working full time. And I feel like that's just the way it's gonna go if I carry on. I'm currently just exhausted by the uncertainty of this project and honestly I just would be much happier doing something else. 
And also, I'm really not an expert game developer, so it would be good to do some more small projects and learn from them. And maybe then when I do big projects in the future, it won't all get on top of me. My last video took me three weeks to make, and I made three games in that time. And it outperformed my other videos by a large margin. And check this out. Platwormer became really popular on itch.io and really, really popular among South Korean streamers and speedrunners. It's really heartening to see people enjoying something that you made. I know! I've lost all joy in life. I really like being able to watch people play the thing after I've made it. So the idea of making videos about making small games and then releasing those games for people to play just sounds really fun. Maybe in the future when Unity has fixed some of these issues and I can spend large amounts of time bug fixing without worrying about running out of money, I can return to this project. But for now, I need to accept defeat and focus on getting videos out regularly and growing the channel. And I think the only realistic way to do that is to keep the project small. So for now, I'm going to focus on making videos like my previous one. One-off contained videos where in 15 minutes to half an hour, I show the beginning, middle and end of a project and then even release the game so you guys can play it. I hope that sounds interesting to you guys. I've got some ideas lined up already, which I think you'll like. And honestly, I just can't wait to get started. I'm in a bit of an uncertain place right now. I haven't been taking paid work because I've been trying to work on zero tag and to do regular uploads, but clearly that didn't go very well. So if you're interested to see what the future of this channel holds and want to help me out, I've set up a Patreon. It's set so that I'll receive donations for each video I release. So if you do decide to back me, you don't need to worry that you'll donate and I won't upload anything because you'll only pay if I do upload something. It's extra incentive for me to get stuff out. Hopefully I can grow this channel to a place where I don't need donations or sponsors or anything. But in the meantime, any help is appreciated. Also, don't forget to check out Core. It's completely free. Use the link in the description to get started. All right, that's the plug over. I'll see you hopefully quite shortly with another video. Bye bye.